the U.S. I have Dr. Thelma Asari. Um, you should all take her numbers. She will inspire you to be better than yourselves, greater than yourselves. Um, I've had the privilege of working closely with her and the team on putting together the Bio Innovation Symposium that we had yesterday in Accra. It's Ghanaian born, a gynecologist, and as a father of three girls, I wish my kids would grow up to be Talma. Wherever she is, you hear her loud and clear. <laughs> we have um, lawyer Francis Danso Ajari. Ajari. In Ghana, we put your title in front of your name. So Lee will be engineer Lee Makoski. Don't ask me where that comes from. It's a leftover from the British. Um, he's an immigration lawyer. And you guys are asking, what is an immigration lawyer doing? or what is a lawyer doing in a biotech presentation? Well, wherever there are new inventions, you're going to need patents and trademarks, and the lawyers know exactly what to do for you. Yesterday, somebody asked a very interesting question. How do they protect their ideas? And I wanted to chime in, but Lee has already warned me about how long I stay on the microphone. <laughs> so I decided to keep quiet. Well, NDAs don't work in this place. They will steal your idea, and you go to court for 20 years, and nothing will happen. So that is stifling innovation. Um, I get the same questions from my students all the time. We have Sam Baird all the way from California. Uh, Sam has been in the startup space for a very long time, and traveling from California to Ghana, guys, takes some commitment. So we are grateful to have you. Last but not the least, uh, Professor Lee Makoski and I met online, and we've been inseparable since then. As you can tell, we are, we are twins, right? Uh, we are <laughs> fraternal twins. Um, Lee is the head of the bioengineering program at Northeastern University. Um, he's an MIT alum also, so uh, for those of you who do not know what MIT is, uh, it takes a lot of hard work to get in. And it takes a lot of hard work to get out. <laughs> uh, so Lee's background is interesting. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from Brown University and a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT. Don't ask me how that happened, because in Ghana, that doesn't happen. <laughs> in Ghana, he would not even be allowed to teach <laughs> physics at the graduate school level. But as I often remind you guys, knowledge doesn't have definitive boundaries. Knowledge is the continuum. And Lee has been in the biological engineering space for a very long time. So now don't ask me how a physics graduate, an electrical engineering PhD, ends up teaching biological, chemical engineering, and all those processes. That doesn't happen here, Lee. If you can tell our regulators how you did that, We'll be very happy to know. So today, I just thought you know they'll spend some time with us here before heading back on a long trip back to California and Maryland and Boston. So ask all the questions that you can ask. It doesn't matter if your major is in biomedical or not. If you go into a bi biomedical industry, you have accountants there, you have marketers there, you have HR people who are not biomedical engineers by training, but have to hire biomedical engineers. So ask all the questions that you can. The biospace in Ghana, with their help, is about to take off. And who knows where you are going to end up. Without further ado, and all the warnings I've received from Professor Lee Makoski, staying on this microphone, please, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. So, uh, Professor McBigan Laurie, I, I, I want to thank you very much for your hospitality, your invitation to come and visit Academic City uh, today and uh, uh, to see the, uh, the, the marvelous facilities that you've put together here. Uh, this is my third trip to Ghana, and it, it, they've been wonderful. I, interacting with the people here and uh, talking to the people, whether they're engineers or 
nurses or midwives or physicians uh, or businessmen. Uh, it's, it's been a real education for me. Uh, we've spent the last week with my colleagues, Sam and Thelma and Francis, uh, going, um, running a symposium yesterday and a workshop on Tuesday and visiting uh, healthcare facilities, everything from uh, village health clinics to Corley Boo uh, Hospital. Uh, Professor Bag McBagan Lurie it told you that I, I started out in physics and wandered into electrical engineering and then figured out that I was really interested in, in biology. And uh, uh, I sometimes wonder how I ended up uh, in, in Ghana in the first place. Uh, but it's, it's exciting. Uh, what I want to tell you is that you should follow your passions. Uh, think about what you hear that you really enjoy. And uh, take every opportunity. I'm a teacher, first and foremost. And I believe in the young people of this world. You're the future. You're the people who are going to make a difference who can make a difference. Look at the world around you and try to understand why and how and what you would like to change for the better. That's the first. Because if you are doing something that you enjoy and you're doing something you believe in, you're going to do a better job. And you're going to enjoy much more. You're going to have much more gratification for what you do. So think about that. And don't, don't be constrained by administrative boundaries. As Mc, Professor McBagan Lurie said, you know, I started out with, uh, in physics. I had no idea what I wanted to do with physics. I just thought it was cool. And, uh, and then I thought maybe materials science, which is kind of like physics. But then I realized that the most interesting materials are the stuff that, that wiggles, you know, living materials. And Although I got my PhD in electrical engineering, it, I actually was studying biological materials as I was getting that PhD. So if you see something you're interested in, pay attention, because that's something that your, your brain is going to want to do a lot of. Yeah. So are you a bioengineer? No, what are you an engineer of? Computer engineer. engineer. Okay, computer engineers, if, no matter what you're doing, I don't care if it's bioengineering or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering, pay attention to computers. Unfortunately, they're taking over the world. There's nothing we can do about that. Computer engineers are, are, are people that you're going to have to depend on, but, but it's also, these are tools that we're all going to use for a very long time. So. I don't care what your major is and what your focus is, find an excuse to become as good as you can in computer engineering. Is there any particular part of computer engineering you're interested in? Hardware, software, webs? Software. Okay, yes, fabulous. I spend a lot of time, I'm, I'm a terrible computer programmer, okay? But I'm pretty good with algorithms and I spend a lot of time working on, on developing algorithms to, I go back to my electrical engineering roots, separate signal from noise. So why don't we move the, the microphone down here and ask the next person along what she's spending time doing. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. You've got a lot of computer science people here. Okay, any particular part? Uh, software, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, uh, cybersecurity. Artificial security. intelligence. I, I have quite a few colleagues who I think are artificially intelligent or maybe not so intelligent. But I, I've always wondered about artificial intelligence. Art what is artificial intelligence? I'm not sure I know. Sorry? What, what is artificial intelligence? Um, I would say it's putting your intelligence in a machine, like putting your human intelligence, making a machine able to do what? I think we're going to be able to do that. Yes. It's a little scary, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Let's move the microphone down. What, do you, what, what, what are you going to be doing? Biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering. Now, so, so I, I'm, I'm the head of bioengineering at Northeastern. And 
we, we formed, a new, it was a new department 10 years ago. We started the department and we had no idea what we wanted to do in bioengineering. We didn't even know for sure what bioengineering was. We were asking, what is bioengineering? And people think bioengineering, well, it's all of those machines that stand next to a hospital bed in the intensive care unit. But it also could be the molecular circuits inside a cell, which you can manipulate to make a cell, perhaps, uh, create anti-cancer drugs. So bioengineering is all manner of things. Uh, we have faculty that are involved in musculoskeletal uh, mechanics. We have faculty that, that work on cell and tissue engineering. We, what's that? Professor McBagginler is afraid I'm going to end up in the emergency room. And, and, and then I'll have to depend on bioengineers to, uh, to, keep, to keep me alive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what part of bioengineering are you interested in? Bioinformatics. Bioinformatics. Informatics. Informatics are fabulous. One of the reasons I think that bioengineering is going to be explosively interesting in the next few years is a combination of informatics driven by computers, of course, and genomics, because we can now sequence everybody's genome so fast. And there's an incredible amount of data there. And we're trying to figure out what to do with it. We've got so much data we don't know what to do with. It. But informatics are going to give you the tools to, to tease out interesting information from those from that genomics information. So that's a fabulous thing to go into. But let me digress and go back to, yes, you're, I'm, I'll get to you in a minute. You know, when we started to form the bioengineering department at Northeastern, we made a list of all of the things that we wanted our students to learn. And I realized we needed to keep the students there for seven years. And I went to the dean and I said, I need a seven year bachelor's program. <laughs> and for some reason she didn't like the idea, you know. And I said, think of all the tuition. But she still didn't like the idea. So anyway, we, we, we found a way to, to uh, let each student focus in one part of bioengineering so that by the time they finished their four-year program, they didn't know all of bioengineering, but they knew the part of bioengineering that they wanted. And bioinformatics is, a, is a, a critical part of that. So good luck with that. Are there any particular questions that you would like to answer with bioinformatics? What's that? She'll pass on that. That's a very smart answer. <laughs> okay, what are you doing? Um, I'm doing mechanical engineering. Biomedical engineering? No, mechanical. Mechanical engineering. We forgive people who are in mechanical engineering. It's okay. <laughs> what, what, what sort of things do you like to do in, in, in particular? Sorry? What particular do you, things do you like to do? Um, I'm mostly interested in design and manufacturing. Design and manufacturing. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. Because, because we're always going to need you. So, okay, I'll, I'll let you pass it on. She's, she's trying to get rid of that microphone as soon as she possibly can. So, so what, what's your major? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Yes. Why did you decide artificial intelligence? <laughs> it's just a cool name, right? <laughs> no, I think it, it's, it's, you know, there's a, there's a huge, huge number of, of, of algorithms in, in artificial intelligence that are going to be extraordinarily useful in the future. You know, you, get, you go to the air, airport, at, at least in America, you go to the airport now, they don't look at your boarding pass. They, they, do, they do facial recognition. And it's kind of scary. They look at me and they say, oh, Lee, there you are. We know who you are. Uh, how do they do that? You know, and, and, and artificial intelligence, these algorithms that are so, so great. What year are you? Sorry. What year are you in? Level 200. Second year. Ah, okay, okay. I'm having real trouble with the, the with the. Maybe we're better off without the microphone. I don't know. It's a small room. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure the microphones are all. It, it's for some.
I, I, you know, I avoid technology when I can, right? Anyway. Okay. So, what are, you, what are your interests in electrical engineering? Telecommunications, Telecommunications which is spectacular these days. It, it's astonishing, you know, I'd, uh, I got on WhatsApp and was talking to my wife yesterday, and, and uh, you know, and, and she's like, how did that work? You know, 10 years ago, there's no way that could happen. So, it's communications are, are just, it, it, you know, uh, I, I think very exciting nowadays. Fantastic. Okay. I want to stop for a second, and, and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you who uh, sat in the front row, uh, and, and see if people have questions. Because I've spent a lot of time in academia, and uh, I've worked in a national laboratory. I worked in a funding agency for a while. Uh, I've consulted for biotech companies occasionally. So anybody got questions? Uh, about engineering, about uh, bioengineering, about uh, what are you thinking? You showed up here because people were making you show up here. To, yes, question. Sure, I'm going to let uh, Sam Bird answer that question. The key to the future in medicine will be information, where you can get a million people and uh, you can look at their history because they have, uh, they've done their uh, DNA and they, you've watched their progress and you can tie together what causes problems and what causes good things happening. It's all artificial intelligence can, can figure out what humans cannot see the detail of. And when you get, like I say, a million, there'll be a billion. People, people in China are giving their information and China is learning about what's happening and what is, what is progressing. And so artificial intelligence is a tool to interpret. It's not, it's not the key thing. Nothing is the one key thing. It all comes together including mechanical engineering. <laughs> uh, my degree originally was mechanical engineering. All of my work in my, my career was in 
medical equipment or uh, biotech. And, and I did a lot of work in, in the original stuff that got to DNA and so forth. So uh, it's, it, the key is to interpret what's going on, and our intelligence addresses that. And I'll give you a specific example. Uh, about two years ago, we had a professor from another university give a talk at Northeastern University. And he had access to the electronic uh, CAT scans from 30,000 patients. 30,000. You think about, oh, I'll take a look at those CAT scans. 30,000 patients. Do you know how long it would take a person to look at 30,000 three-dimensional images of the, of, of, of the lungs of, of patients? forever. But what he was able to do is essentially using algorithms of artificial, from, you know, artificial intelligence types of algorithms to identify subsets of those patients with different diseases, even rare diseases, because once you have databases of that size, you can start going through patterns and finding out, okay, all of the people diagnosed with this particular disease have this particular oddity in their, in their CAT scan. And then you can use that to predict. You have a new patient comes in, you take a CAT scan, you use artificial intelligence to tell what that CAT scan is closest to in the, that database of 30,000 people. You come back and you say, we've got a diagnosis. And that can be so much more accurate than a radiologist, just because a radiologist, a one person, doesn't have the wherewithal for processing that much information. But even a computer can't do it without the right algorithms. And, and artificial intelligence is a way of, of is, is a subset of algorithms which allow you to do that. And one of the things about, about, about the future is big data. And, and it's not just going to be in radiology, it's going to, and it's not going to be just in genomics, it's going to be everywhere. There's big data everywhere, and to deal with that Dealing with huge data sets is beyond the capability of a human brain. But with computers and the right algorithms, we can identify patterns, just like Sam said, and tweak out really interesting and important information. So it might be a way of, of, of advanced diagnostics. Questions? Questions? Ah, good. Um, so I'd like to know how your transition was from electrical engineering to bioengineering. Was it chaotic? Was it a smooth journey? How did you handle it? Were there people there to help you out? A lot of people helped me out. In fact, it, I would say my transition was a little rocky. And uh, I ended up having to talk to the dean of the graduate school at one point because uh, I was kind of, uh, they thought I was, was sort of falling off of the, the, the pathway. So I got, started getting interested in biological applications of electrical engineering when I was still a physics student. And then, as, as Professor McDuck and Lurie said, I went from Brown University, where I was in physics, to MIT, where I was in electrical engineering. And so I was focusing on biological applications of electrical engineering even then. Uh, but then I, I started to realize I was interested in, in molecular protein and in, in, in other molecular structures and how they functioned. And that basically required me to find faculty members, professors, who were doing that sort of research and to work with them. Uh, I was pretty naive, and it took me a while to actually do it. Um, but from an intellectual point of view, it required a lot of patience, because I, I knew all of this math, and I knew all of these, these electrical engineering sorts of things. But I didn't know anything about biology. And so my professor sat down and said, you've got to learn a lot of biology. So uh, combining what I, you know, I just had to study and study and study biology. But the more important was to, to go, to, go to, to lectures and, you know, go, and you couldn't go online back then. But nowadays you can go online and, and get a lecture about just about anything. And, and it was really about learning about the things that I wanted to learn about. Let me give you an example. I mean, I've, I've studied protein structure, okay? Proteins are really cool, okay? Proteins are, 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 are like little molecular machines. When, when I do this, 
billions and billions of proteins are interacting with one another so that, that, I, can, that I can wiggle my fingers. It's, it's more interesting than that. I had to make a decision to wiggle my fingers. Proteins in my brain decided, oh, I'm going to wiggle my fingers, and they triggered electrical impulses through my nerves all the way to my fingers, allow me to do this. I can do this. I don't even have to look at my fingers and I know what I'm doing. How does that happen? It's, for me, it's, it's an awesome set of, of things to do. And so I find, I find proteins completely uh, extraordinary. But I didn't know enough about proteins originally to know what the right questions were to ask. And you know, we, we, we had a, a talk from a, a, an entrepreneur yesterday at the symposium we were at. And what he said was that as he was trying to build his company up, he had a startup company that's very successful here in Ghana. He said he had to do research and research and research. And he said the one reason it, it's, it's not hard to do nowadays is he says there's a YouTube about everything. You want to learn about something, there's a YouTube out there. But you've got to do your research. I want to add to that in that if you're going to do research on the things you think are interesting and that you want to, to do research on, you've got to be, you've got to have a, a certain level of intellectual discipline. You've got to understand how A causes B, causes C. You've got to know how the system works in as much detail as possible. I think one of the exciting things is, is to have some ideas and, and decide that you're going to uh, produce a, a you know engineer a product that you can then sell to customers. In particular, from my point of view, of course, would be medical supplies or devices or instruments. How do you do that? Sometimes you have to partner. Okay, I want to know. I want to tell you. I have no idea about business. I have no idea how to work with with uh, how, how to form a company. If I wanted to form a company, I would have to partner with people who understood business and people who understood the, the biomedical needs, whereas I might understand just the engineering part of it. So one of the things that, that you need to do in addition to follow the things that are interesting is learn how to talk to people and work to, with people. And you can learn a lot of things online, but you're eventually going to have to work with teams of people to get things done. Because one of the things, especially in biomedical engineering, is you're almost always going to have to have a multidisciplinary team because so many things go on in bioengineering that, that you know, it, you're not going to know everything. So you've got to be able to work with people and work with people you trust. I, I have the following example. In, in, again, another reason why I think biology is cool. Let's say you want to do something really simple. You want, you've, got a, you've got a battery here and you've got a motor over here and you want to attach the battery to the motor and turn it on. Well, that's easy. You get a piece of wire, you attach it to the battery, you attach it to the motor, done. That's easy. You can do that on top of a bench. Now, what if that was in the chest cavity of a patient? Suddenly, the number of questions you have to ask about that wire, that simple wire, becomes huge. The, the insulation in the wire, will it break down? Presumably, with if, 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 lucky, it's going to undergo oscillatory motion, hopefully for years, in the chest cavity of a patient, right? It's going to be exposed to the corrosive interior of the, uh, of the chest cavity, so that the, the plastic insulation in the wire might break down. The, the motion might cause the, 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 the metal in the wire to get brittle, and break. So instead of just having an electrical engineer combine the two, you're going to need a material scientist, probably a polymer expert, maybe a metallurgist, a cardiologist, and probably somebody I've forgotten. You can't do things with just one expertise. You've got to be willing to work in a team. So I can't even remember the question that you asked me at this point. <laughs> but I, but I probably gave you more than you were looking for anyway. <laughs> Questions? Yes, I see. So the person behind you raised her hand first. <laughs> yes? Uh, 
online. Okay, so I wanted to know, right now you're with Northeastern University, and from what I could see online, you've worked with a lot of universities. Well, I wanted to know, have you done industry work? Have you worked with companies? And also, what field of bioengineering are you most interested in? What yeah. industries? Have you okay. worked with sure. companies, like so, in industry? So I've never actually been employed by a, a, a company. I, I have consulted for several companies, always in, in pharmaceuticals. Uh, yeah, essentially always in, in pharmaceuticals. So I don't have industrial experience. I know a lot of people who do. Um, and, and one of the things that we do at Northeastern University is we make all of our students actually spend six months working in a company. And they come back with, with very, very interesting and important stories about what they've learned being in a company. And it's obviously very different from being in school. Uh, but, uh, but I'm going to hand over to Sam, who spent a lot of time in companies, to answer your question. So uh, I have a long career. Um, the first two thirds of it were working with companies. And the last was my own company that I formed. And working for companies is interesting because they want you to do something, and it's not always what's, what you feel is the correct thing. And you've got to be cognizant, you have to be aware that they are the employer, and you can't say no, but you can say, I think this is a better idea. And so as you get into things, as you get, as you get employed, you have to be aware of what's going on around you, not just your job, but how that that how that job, how that work will be used, and sometimes it might not be something that you agree with, and you've got to you've got to be forthright, but not argumentative, and not and sometimes you have to do things that you might not like, but in a in a in a company you do what what the employer basically is telling you must be done, is most of the time, okay, so. When you're working for companies, usually they are not just one small area. That's where companies start. Usually they get to be somewhat larger. And so you get experience in all kinds of things. My original degree I mentioned before was mechanical. But all of my work since then has been in chemistry, in uh, electrical, electromechanical. I think the future of medicine is going to be in the watch because the sensors will be able to say what's going on and it can transmit it to the doctor and the scientist and everything else for research. And so it's, the key is not obvious what it's gonna be in the future. Nobody thinks of a watch as being the key to the future now. I think it will be later, maybe 10, 20 years, okay? So when you get to, a, to be employed, as Lee said, try to find something you, that, that interests you that you enjoy doing, that's the way you'll do the most work. You can't always get that. You have to take what, what you can get, but try to find something that, that will lead you to what you enjoy doing and, and what, you, what you get satisfaction from. And that's another thing. It's not just enjoyment. Satisfaction is accomplishing something. And that's, that's, that's just as important as enjoying it in the first place, is accomplishing something that you feel is important. Okay, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's my, my interpretation of, of employers. Separately, when you start your own company, be aware that you're gonna be the same thing. You're gonna be doing work that you might not agree with because you have to, in order to make, make uh, survive the company. The last thing I'll say is what I always say to, to, to all, in all the things I do, I try to do things that are reliable, are um, long-lasting, and are self-sufficient. That is, they have a way to, to keep going. You're not depending on government to give you money and, and, and when it goes away, the thing stops. That you actually have something that's self-sustaining. And believe it or not, that, that is important when you, when, you, when you do something for yourself. And a lot of you will start your own companies eventually. I hope so. As I said a minute ago, that you always need a multidisciplinary team. Even standing up in front of students, I need a multidisciplinary team to answer the questions. We, we did have another question over here. So, 
Yes. Oh. What field in bioengineering would you say you are most interested in? I'm most interested in? Oh, what I'm interested in has nothing to do with what you're interested in. You should, you should go for, for what it is. Five years ago, I decided I was going to spend a long time trying to understand Alzheimer's disease. And so I've spent the last five years putting a lot of effort into understanding better Alzheimer's disease. And then somewhere along the way, I met a bunch of people from Ghana and suddenly found myself in, in rural Ghana worrying about how to improve the resources in health clinics in this part of the world. So you never quite know where your career may lead you. So I don't think that what my interests are should have any impact on what your interests are. Follow your heart, follow your mind, and do something that you think is interesting. And in terms of maybe what you really meant was where are the real great important opportunities in the future? Again, I'm not sure about those, but what I am sure is that computers are going to be a part of every opportunity in the future. Now we got a question in front. Yes. Yeah, I can't find the switch either. You know, just. some controversy about whether they are able to conduct their research in a way that is ethical, such as they don't interfere with nature, they don't, because there's risk of weaponizing maybe a new drug or a new treatment or something. So my question to you is how were you able to navigate, or how would you be able to navigate those things while you're doing your research, especially in academia? How do you be able to deal with such things? Because um, technology is advancing and as the te technology is advancing, the population is also growing. So with more interest in these things comes more backlash or comes more questions being posed. That's my first question. So how, how do we deal with ethical issues in bioengineering, basically? That, no, 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 no. Ethics, ethics, not lawyers. That's the most difficult question people have asked me today. That is a really hard question. What I like to tell my students is, I don't believe I know any more about ethics than you do. And ethics are a little bit different for everybody. But you're absolutely right that as technology advances, they bring up more and more deeply ethical and disturbing questions. I, I have a, 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 one thing that bothers me right now. Uh, a niece of mine has a, a, a chronic uh, uh, um, inflammation of the intestines and right now she's young enough that she's covered with by her mother's uh, health insurance but the treatment for this chronic inflammation is $50,000 a year $75,000 a year and next year she's going to stop being on her mother's insurance which is covering it right now and she has no idea how she'll be able to pay for this treatment. It's a treatment that, that makes her healthy and happy, and without it, she's essentially uh, unable to, to do anything. What an, how do you do that? How do you, you know, how do you keep a, a life-saving saving treatment away from a person who, who needs it? It's just one of, 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 a, of a million ethical questions that, that modern technology is, is, is putting forward. I don't have any good answers. But I'm very glad that you're thinking about it. I encourage all of my students to think about it because it's things that, especially in bioengineering, we're going to have to face every day. Thelma, do you want to say anything about this? Because bioethics is really tough. Well, the I, I, is in a I, I think um, it's kind of an innate um, 
thing. You either an ethical, moral person or you're not. Um, one of the things that I've been asked of me over the years when I come back to Ghana often is, why don't you just come and set up a clinic here? You make a lot of money. Um, and that is true. The reason that I have not is because, to me, you literally have to cater to just the rich and not take care of other people. Uh, it's not so much the case in the U.S. And so what bothers me a lot when I come back is um, the fact that there are physicians who we are all supposed to take care of people to the best of our ability, and they seem to just switch on and off depending on whether somebody has money or not in this country. And so that bothers me a lot. And to me, you may not be able, if you don't have all the technology, but just innate compassion and just feeling for the other is something that I find lacking. And to me, you either you have it or you don't. It's not something that somebody has to teach you. Um, I think we all have the ability to do the right thing. Um, and so the fact that you're even thinking about it tells me that you are an ethical person. And perhaps you may find a way to conduct your research or your work in the best way possible without harming um, others or the environment. Um, I think you, we all have it. You just have to learn to keep it as you ascend up and not let perhaps money or something just influence everything. I'll just say that there's no way to predict how the technology you work on will be used in the far future. There are, I'm always amazed by uh, just the collection of data as, as Lee alluded to, insurance companies won't cover certain diseases because it's so expensive. Well, you've worked on the information that they're using to evaluate whether you have that disease or you might get it. And so they apply that to you so that they don't, you know, insurance companies, drug companies, there are all kinds of people that will use the data that, and, and the information that you come up with. The, the uh, artificial intelligence, that will be used in ways that you and I might think are negative, but we can't envision what they'll be in the future. So think about it, but you can't guarantee that everything that you do will be and eventually meet your ethics. Just do the best you can. If you know that something is unethical, as I said before, speak up. So, so um, in the um, healthcare um, industry, nowadays, um, um, testing for gene testing, you can literally draw blood and test a whole myriad of diseases. So, Anybody who is considered quote unquote high risk in obstetrics is a certain age, and that is based on uh, what the chances are that your chromosomes can kind of go funny when they are going to make the egg and the sperm, depending how old somebody is, there's a higher chance. So now there's a test. You can tell whether you're having a boy or girl at 10 weeks of gestation. Um, that gives people, you know, makes them happy. But the original intent is to determine whether there is some abnormality that perhaps may not be compatible with life or that somebody may choose not to stay pregnant, which will go against somebody's moral values. Um, and so now people come in and they ask me, oh, I want that test. And I know exactly what they're talking about. They just want to know whether they're having a boy or girl. And you have to sit there and explain to them that the intent of the test is not just to tell you whether it's a boy or a girl. That bond is already out the door. The first person who told me this was a patient from India. And for them, girl babies are expensive. She did not want to be pregnant as a girl. So that was the reason it was very offensive to me um, because to me, that was not the intent of the test. But now you can test for everything. Um, you can test to see whether you have a higher risk of breast cancer. And for a while, I will tell people, patients, not to test it using their medical insurance. Because once you do that, the information is out there. When you apply for life insurance, the insurance company is going to ask for all your information. And they will look at that 
oh, you have a higher risk of breast cancer. Why would I want to cover you? You're going to cost me money. So then you'll be denied. So I used to tell people, don't do it. Pay for it out of pocket. And that way it's not kind of public um, knowledge. Uh, the government passed a law that, that doesn't tell the company that they must cover you. You want life insurance for when you die. If you have a disease that tells them that you can die, you know, younger or earlier or anything like that, they will also make a business decision not to pay for it. So when people come and the, and the companies that do this come and say, oh, you can test for every disease. There are some diseases I don't even know what they mean. And they come out, we test for 300 diseases. I'm only interested in a few. And they come out with these things and I have to send them to a genetic counselor to tell them what does it mean for me. So it's interesting. And I try and limit, sometimes I don't want to know because I don't feel like it's germane immediately, but it's all out there. You can literally test for everything. Um, I'm, I'm told that we have three minutes left, and I just want to use that time to congratulate you for worrying about the ethical implications of what you're doing. And I urge everybody to just keep in the back of your mind that the things that you do may have ethical implications for the world around you. That shouldn't stop you, but it should make you pause to think about more deeply what, how you're influencing the world. Engineering, whether it's bioengineering or computer engineering, artificial intelligence, mechanical engineering, you have the chance to change the world. Maybe just a little bit. Change it for the better. Use your ethical compass to choose how you're going to use the skills that you're learning here and do the very best you can for the world. As I said at the start, part of the reasons I'm an instru instructor is that I believe in the youth. I believe in the young people. You're our future. I'm depending on you to make this world a little better place. And uh, that's a lot of work. You know, don't, don't go for easy solutions. Don't go for easy courses. Easy is boring. Boring. Okay, if, you were, if you're playing a computer game, you want to play it on the easiest possible setting? No, you want, to, you want to play a computer game on the hard settings, right? Life is like that. You want to do something gratifying? Go for the hard stuff. Don't be scared of it. That's the way to make an impact. I really wish you all the very, very best of luck and I've been delighted with your questions and your responses. Uh, professor, thank you so much for the invitation. This has been fabulous. Do they have opportunities for exchange programs? What's that? Exchange programs. I'm sorry? Do they have opportunities for exchange programs? Okay, so, yes. We, so, so the question is, Thank you, Francis. Uh, this is the second most difficult question I've been asked today. <laughs> so the question is, of course, exchange programs. What are the opportunities? There are a lot of opportunities for education in the United States, obviously. Uh, if you're looking at graduate education, uh, th there are exchange programs where you can come over for a semester. I don't know very much about how that works at Northeastern. There are graduate programs. Uh, usually divided into a, a master's degree or a PhD. Master's degree programs in the US right now tend to be very expensive and you know, one or two years. Uh, but it gives you a, a, a foot in the door to, you know, to basically in, in industrial opportunities. A PhD is a very different beast. Okay? It'll, it tends to be four or five years. Um, the difference is that in most universities in America, if you get into a PhD program, the tuition is free, and they pay you a stipend, which is enough that you can live comfortably in whatever city you happen to be in. The difference, of course, is that, it, that because it's free education, PhD programs are, are very, very competitive. It's very hard to get into. I've been putting a lot of effort in, at Northeastern to try to convince the university to bring in more students from Africa. It's, it's, it's difficult because 
you know, although we are in the business of education, the administrators up there also think that we need to worry about our, our finances. And uh, I'm hoping that in the future we will have many more opportunities for, uh, for bringing students from, from, uh, uh, from Africa into our programs. How that's going to work, I don't know. Okay. Uh, you've figured out who I am. You go on the web, it's really easy to find me. Whether I want you to find me or not, you can find me easily. If you've got other questions about educational opportunities in America, send me an email. I get over 200 emails a day. So if I don't respond for a couple of days, don't get offended, just send me another email. <laughs> I will eventually get to it. Uh, whether I'll be able to help or not is yet to be seen, but I will try very much to, uh, uh, if I don't have the information you need, to try to get you to people who do. Once again, thank you very much. Fred, anything else you'd like me to talk about? Yes. All right, well, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. We appreciate you making time to be here. It's been a busy week. Um, I'm going to call upon one of you to give us a vote of thanks. You know that's how we do it here. And Felix is hiding, and you are my target. <laughs> Come on here. <laughs> Say a little words of thanks. A vote of thanks. Thank you guys for making it here. He speaks his own English, so listen. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, sir. Um, to start off, I will first and foremost say thanks to the Almighty Lord, who has been the precursor of this historic event. In all honesty, I am much more than elated for such a rare opportunity. Felix Dari is my name, a second year biomedical engineering student here at Academic City. We are gathered today under the glow of a new dawn, which makes the advent of a new era in our continent. This encounter is really an impressive testimony to the devotion and dedication of which we all partake in the course of our mother continent and that of her sons and daughters. A great leader is advised others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. We are ready to act out of the integrity and conviction of our most deep founded beliefs owing to the fact that if we allow ourselves to be tempered by narrow self-interest and vain ambition, if we batter our beliefs for short-term advantage, nobody speaks for conscience. We are ready to be nurtured into erudite and law-abiding administrators, hard-working entrepreneurs or public servants, tried and tested facilitators of national development, self-actualized statesmen, and above all, resourceful architects of our continent. In order to propound a new humanism to the world, we are ready for you to be our source of inspiration, optimism, and a living demonstration of vitality to us all. Thank you, Father, and God bless you.